Good evening to you. Good to be with you tonight as we are going to, to look at the third chapter of Hebrews. Before I start reading in Hebrews, I would like to ask all of you if you can do something for me is do not read chapters without by themselves. If you can, when you start a book, it would be nice if you would read the whole book through. That's true in most books. Maybe not for Psalms and Proverbs, but especially in the New Testament, if you read the whole, the whole book. And in even the chapters, I think sometimes, and tonight, I, I would like for us to, like I do often, I would like to look at chapter three, but I would like to read the end of chapter two to get the flow of the thought because the thought is a continuation all the way through Hebrews. It's not written all the 13 verse, the chapters of any of the books in, well, this is this one, then I wrote this one. They wrote it as a single thought or book. So let's tie it together a little bit as we look at, at chapter three. There in two and 18, for in that he, that is Christ himself was has suffered being tempted, he is able to aid those who are tempted. That's something to know. Jesus is qualified to help. Does that make sense? Qualified because it has happened to him and he knows uh, what and how it feels to be tempted. It says, therefore, my holy brethren, Partakers of the heavenly calling, consider the apostle and high priest of our confident Jesus Christ. Now this is a time where Jesus is called the high priest and that doesn't surprise a lot of people, but they look and says, well, he is the apostle. What does an apostle mean? We, we see that Christ had his, uh, you know, the, the 12 apostles. Then Saul was called out of due season. And sometimes we think that's a word just invented for Jesus and his disciples. That was not a word just invented for them. It was a word that was in use before. And even during that time, uh, we look at Barnabas is called an apostle. He is a, an apostle and we see he is called an apostle, but he was an apostle, yes, that was sent forth by the Antioch church. Him and, if it makes sense, the apostle Paul was a double apostle. <laughs> he was an apostle of, of Jesus, but he was also an apostle of. Now we use a word today that helps explain that because I think it's always, I was, when I first started studying the Bible, I was fascinated because Paul went on three missionary journeys but I never saw him called a missionary. Why? Because they use the word apostle. Well, we use the word missionary. Do we have, you know, a church can send forth a missionary. They have a mission. Here is the sense that Jesus is the apostle and high priest. He had a mission from God. Does that make sense? That's what he had. It says, he, that is, Christ was the apostle and high priest uh, uh, of our confidence, Christ Jesus, who was faithful in him, who appointed him, as Moses also was faithful to all, in all of his house. You know, Christ was appointed, and so was Moses was appointed to do something. So we can see, he says, hey, he was, he was faithful, as Moses, it says, for the, this one had been counted worthy of more glory than Moses, inasmuch as he who built a house has more honor than the house. Do what he who builds the house. Uh, this is talking about Christ. He is the builder of the house. Um, <laughs> I, I have to go back and have your mind go back to Matthew chapter 16 and verse 18, where he asked the disciples, whom do men say that I am? And Peter says, they are the Christ. And, and of course he said, upon this confession and upon this, I'm going to build my church. 
Who, what did Christ do? He built his church. He, he was going to build his church. He did that. He paid his own blood so that that church might be built. We realize that. Matter of fact, we go on. It says, for every house is built by someone. For he who built all things is God. He who builds all things is God. We look and we can know that Christ, you know, Christ, God, built everything. And Christ was with God in the beginning. Look, if you would, if you, if you think about it, look at Genesis 1 and 26, where God said, let us make man in our image. He didn't say let me, but let us make God, man in our image. God was with Christ in the very beginning. He was with God in the beginning. The Spirit was there because we see it also in Genesis that the Spirit moved upon the face of the deep. The Spirit, the Godhead was present at the creation. It says, he goes on, and Moses indeed was faithful as all his house, a servant for a, for a testament of those things which would be spoken afterwards. But Christ as a son over his own house, whose house we are. We are the house, we are the house. We are the Christ house. We are the, the church. Because we are what? We are, if we hold the confidence and the rejoicing of the hope firm to the end. Therefore, the Holy Spirit said this, Today, if you will hear his voice, do not harden your heart as, as in the rebellion, in the day of the trials in the wilderness, where your father tested me, tried me, and saw my work forty years years therefore i was angry with this generation that generation and said they all always go astray they always go astray notice he's i love the next statement always go astray in their hearts their heart was not right like the old song that we sing is thou heart right with god Oh boy, that's a verse. That's a question. We have to keep our heart right. And it says, And they have not known my way. So I swore in my wrath, they shall not enter my rest. We need to realize we have to enter God's rest. We can only do it through Christ Jesus. I would want to go along with this I, I feel that it's important we look at Colossians 1 Colossians 1 and 14 through 18 I think it's important we look at what Christ and, and, and there in Colossians 1 14 through 18 it says in whom we have redemption through his blood the forgiveness of sin he is the image of the invisible God, the firstborn over all cre creation. For by him all things was created that are in heaven, that are on, that is on the earth, visible and invisible, whether thrones or dominion or principalities or power. All things was created to him and for him. And he is before all things, and in him all things consist. And then 18, and he, that is Christ, and he is the head of the body, the church, who is the beginning, the firstborn from the dead, that in all things he may have the preeminence. In all things he may have his, the preeminence. What does that mean? He's the most important thing in the church. We need to realize that he is our savior. He is our brother. He is, he is God's son. He is, he is the head 
of the church. And I like a warning. The last few verses in chapter 3, beginning at 12. Beware, brethren, lest there be in any of you an evil heart of, dis, of, of unbelief in departing from the living God. But exhort one another daily while it is called today, lest any of you be hardened to the deceitfulness of sin. What? Exhort one another. Exhort. What, what does that mean? That means strongly encourage. I believe in that right, brother. Strongly encourage. We are to exhort. Strongly encourage one another. It's not good enough for a Christian to say, well, I'm faithful and not worry about his brothers. We have to be like Christ. Christ worried about mankind. He worried. Look at John chapter 17 when he prayed. He prayed. He prayed for those disciples that had been with him. He said, not only do I pray for them, but also for those that might believe on me through them. He prayed. We have to exhort and think about one another. It says, for if we have become partakers of partakers of Christ, for we have become partakers of Christ if we hold the beginning of our conf of our confidence steadfast to the end. While it is said, Today, if you will hear his voice, do not harden your heart as in the rebellion. We are not to harden our heart. Those who, having heard, rebelled. Indeed, was it not all who came out of Egypt, led by Moses? How with those was he angry 40 years? Was it not with those who sinned, whose corrupt, who corpse fell in the wilderness? Why? He, he's saying, this is something that we need to, to realize. A lot of people are satisfied crossing the sea. Have you ever thought of anything that I, I, I don't understand, but I do understand, but it's hard to. Those Egyptians was in slavery. They came to the edge and all of a sudden the army was behind them and God opened up the Red Sea. They walked across and then they even then they was worried because the army followed after them but God closed that sea. But did you know they were satisfied in the sense they did not realize they still they still looked back. They still looked back and they wouldn't trust in God. They complained about no food. They complained. They complained. They didn't obey. They didn't have faith even when they came after just a couple of years to the edge of the promised land. The spies went in and it was everything that God had told them. They carried out grapes. It took two men to carry the bunch. But still yet, they did not trust God. They crossed the Red Sea, the water on either side, but they was not strong enough to keep following. I'm worried about people. I'm worried about so many Jesus even had those. He called 12. One of them turned away. I have baptized and led many to Christ. But my percentage is not as high as Christ. I tell you right now, brother, that's, that's hard, but it, my percentage is not that high because I know people that have turned back, went back to Egypt. Verse 18, And to whom did he swear that they would not enter his rest, but those who did not obey? What? 
and 18 and 19 need to be read together. One statement, one reading. Let us read these two. And to whom did he swear that they would not enter his rest, but to those who did not obey? So we see that they could not enter in because of unbelief. Somebody said, what, 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 no, no, because they didn't obey. Not obeying is unbelief. Believing, somebody said, well, you believe and you are saved. Yes, and you have unbelief and you're lost. <laughs> somebody, unbelief, I never heard of it. Yes, you have just then. You know what unbelief is? Not obeying. That's the definition of unbelief. Friend, neighbor, brethren, I want you to look at God's word. I want you to look at Hebrews who was a letter saying that we have a high priest. We, God sent the apostle, his apostle, his one to us, his son. Not only his son, not that he made, but he gave. He gave Christ to take on a human body and to suffer in that body till it died. And he did it for you. And he did it for me. God be with you till we meet again.